Hi, this is Mrs. White, and this is the second part of shock. This is the stages of shock, presentation number two. For the stages of shock, we technically, I think, have four stages, but the initial stage will keep off by itself because that's when the body is noticing something and is often not clinically apparent. So it's when the barrel receptors are starting to respond. How, again, we may not see that uh, clinically. But we should be able to find them in stage one. So how do we find it is a good question. So it's all about the blood pressure, and we'll, we'll talk about that shortly. But one thing I want you to understand is that shock is not self-limiting. So if we find ourselves in compensatory shock or a patient in compensatory shock, it is not going to self-limit and they're just going to get better. It is progressive and they will go through the stages of shock. So early shock is where we can do the most good. So the things I want you to know about this slide too is if you see early shock compensatory, that means the same thing. You may see decompensated or progressive shock, that means the same thing, or irreversible or late shock, they mean the same thing. So a little bit more about shock. Uh, we touched into it briefly at the end of the last presentation, but for this one, a um, little different graphic here for you. And this comes from um, easymedlearning.com, which I think is great if you want to check them out. In order to have adequate perfusion, and what are we perfusing? Remember, it's oxygen and glucose into the tissues, into the cells. Basically, there could be uh, some different problems. We could have a problem with uh, the pump itself or the heart. We could have a problem with the vasculature or the tones. Uh, we could have a problem with the volume. And we could also have a problem with the tissues and organs. Uh, these would be things, uh, something like um, the organ itself is just not functional. But in general, we need sufficient volume, we need a good pump, and we need enough tone. Shock will occur if there is a disruption or failure in any of these. And as we start to talk about the different stages, of the first stage of shock that we're going to talk about is compensatory shock, or stage one. You can see there I have a babbling brook. So we, we can hear the water, we can see the water, but it doesn't look so dangerous, does it? So for this, the person's blood pressure generally will remain within normal limits, though you will see it decreased from their baseline. This is why it's so important for us as nurses to make sure that we are knowing the person's baseline. We need to trend these vital signs. It's no longer just a picture in time. We need to see where they are, where they've been. The signs and symptoms may be absolutely subtle. We'll see a slight decrease in their blood pressure, but what you will notice is that their heart rate will increase. So there, it should be triggering us to note that they need a higher heart rate to maintain the blood pressure. At this point of the game, for this patient, you should be able to recognize the signs of shock. And we need to assess our patients early and often and to prevent them from going into hypotension because as they become hypotensive, that further decreases perfusion. Catching a person in stage one shock can save a life. So let's talk a little bit more about blood pressures and what that means. Let me just move this over so you can see it. This is an important math that you need to be aware of. This is the mean arterial pressure. So what is that, right? So the mean arterial pressure is basically cardiac output plus uh, multiplied by the peripheral vascular resistance because all of these are necessary requirements and they're all in this expression. 
So cardiac output's determined by volume and pump strength or contractility. And the systemic or peripheral vascular resistance is the third factor, which is determined by tone. So we do need a map of at least 65 to make sure that we are delivering sufficient oxygen and glucose to those vital organ systems. True map really can only be calculated using um, invasive monitoring and formulas. However, our blood pressure cuffs are more than um, adequate in giving us the ballpark figure. And it's something that I want you guys to get used to looking at, not just the person's blood pressure, but their map. So for example, somebody who has a blood pressure of 80 over 50, their map turns out to be 60, so they're hypoperfused. So fool around with the numbers a little bit, see if you can kind of bring them up, uh, try and you know see what can get you a map of at least 65 with that. So the person needs a map of 65. MAP will be a continued focus during our talks on shock, as well as things like urine output and some other indices that tell us how the patient is doing. So going back into uh, stage one of shock or compensatory shock, uh, this is a little slide that kind of ties it all up. So uh, the sympathetic nervous system is maintaining the cardiac output but the person cannot do it without some adaptations, including tachycardia, they're tachypneic, so they're breathing deeper and faster. This will lead to the person being in a temporary, sort of short-lived respiratory alkalosis, so in the early phase. So uh, the body is starting to make uh, lactic acid. However, it's still not enough to overwhelm the respiratory system at this time. You might see a decrease in urine output, and this is related to the release of the antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone. Cold, clammy skin is a result of alpha-1, right? Remember, alpha-1 is a patent, I'm sorry, potent vasoconstrictor. And another thing to be well aware of is that Beta blocker use, which is especially common among the elderly, but can be of any age, can block tachycardia, which can mask early shock. So you might not see their heart rate increase because they're physiologically unable to increase the heart rate. This means that a person who is on beta blockers is likely to transition into decompensated shock a lot faster without spending much time in the compensatory phase. So don't be fooled if you don't see their increased heart rate. They can't do it. So the nursing responsibilities for a person who starts into shock, uh, and I think this is a good spot to just talk about it, is to make sure that we're assessing for those signs of good perfusion. So our vital signs, urine output, uh, their mental status, their skin status, we need to make sure that we are watching them for circulatory overload. So the treatment goals really do go on. I, I, they're like identifying and correcting the underlying cause of shock. But because we do know that there is a problem with uh, oxygenation, that there's a, we do apply oxygen, and we often give IV fluids. So it's always a potential that because of the leaking and the sheer amount of fluids that have to be given for many people that they could have some circulatory overload. So we do know what that looks like. We looked at it as a possibility for blood transfusion reactions. Monitoring their labs and ABGs. Administering their IV fluids and medications. So the medications are generally vasopressors and also sometimes sedating agents to decrease oxygen demands. Maintaining IV access at all times and having a spare site, right? We want to have multiple access points on the patient, so we need at least two large bore IVs. Normal thermia is very important. We wanna make sure that we prevent shivering. For shock patients, you need to keep them warm. 
We do blood cultures and antibiotics, and uh, many people who don't start out with septic shock, we still make sure that uh, we look at possible infectious sources and to understand that the effect of the body, uh, of shock on the body, is that it can actually cause increased susceptibility to infection and sepsis. And then, of course, the patient and family anxiety. Uh, one more thing I wanted to mention for circulatory overload, there's something called abdominal compartment syndrome. Basically, that's when we third space into the intra-abdominal cavity, and this can place uh, pressure on those blood vessels, which decreases the venous return to the heart. So um, it also can elevate the diaphragm and make breathing more difficult. And one of the things we do use when we're monitoring our patients is the CVP, central venous pressure, to monitor the fluid status in the right atrium. So that can help us decide if a person has too much fluid or not enough fluid on board. So write that down, CVP, central venous pressure, and we'll talk about it later in these presentations as well. The next stage of shock is considered progressive or decompensated shock. Remember that the shock is not self-limiting. We will progress through the stages if we do not stop the process that is causing the shock to begin with. All right, at this point, the sympathetic nervous system can no longer overcome hypoperfusion. You'll see the MAP start to fall under 65. Systolic blood pressure is often under 90. But to be sure that we don't need a systolic blood pressure under 90 to meet the criteria for progressive shock, we just need a fall of 40 millimeters mercury under the baseline. Lactic acid starts to increase, and you'll see it greater than 4. And then pulse pressures. We have a narrowing pulse pressure. So basically, what's happening here is the systolic is falling. We have decreased systemic vascular uh, resistance initially, decreased cardiac output. So the heart can't pump out. And then because of the vasoconstriction, now our numbers are getting closer. So for example, here is the blood pressure of 80 over 60. The pulse pressure is 20. Normal would be 30 to 40, depending on the source that you use. But we'll take that as an average. 30 to 40 would be normal pulse pressure. The patient at this time would need to have a ICU level of care. They need hemodynamic monitoring, including the central venous pressure and arterial blood gases, as well as perhaps even central line monitoring of their blood pressure. They often will need mechanical ventilation. We need IV fluids to replace the volume, because remember, uh, when we're in shock, we have that leaking, so we're losing fluid from the intravascular spaces. Uh, vasopressors to help with the tone and also the cardiac output, so the pump antibiotics, and uh, enteral feed, something we haven't really talked about yet, but we need to start these quickly because they keep the intestines moving. Peristalsis keeps perfusion to the gut, can prevent ischemic bowel and gangrene, and also assists with glycemic control. And then another thing we need to consider here is uh, GI bleed prevention, so the stress on the body. So the person should be on proton pump inhibitors like protonics or H2 blockers. Uh, H2 blockers, so those are histamine blockers like famotidine. Famotidine is used both in allergic reactions as well as for pressure ulcer prevention, I'm sorry, not pressure ulcer, but um, gastric ulcer prevention and GI bleed prevention. If we are not able to get the person restored at that time, then we will progress to the third stage or irreversible shock, which is also called refractory shock. 
the hallmark here is multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. So basically that's altered function of two or more organs that require medical intervention. So this isn't like somebody's creatinine creeping up or some crackles in their lungs. This means that you have to support them. For example, dialysis for your renal failure, ventilation and a ventilator because of your pulmonary failure, vasopressors because of your circulation collapse. So the statistics are pretty poor in this. If we have alteration in one organ, 20% mortality. Once we get to four organs, 70% of the folks will pass away. And you can see my picture here that uh, at this point, the ship is going over the falls and it will not be saved more than likely. So in this stage of shock, we do continue all treatments are, that are possible. We usually don't withdraw all the supports. We tend to keep doing everything because we still would be able to have some people who might survive. But this is a very difficult time for the families because um, these are conversations that will need to be had about advanced directives, what would the patient want, what does it look like on the other side of things if the patient continues to um, go down this road and uh, death is, is it imminent? Is, are we merely holding it off? What's, what does it do to the person long term, right? If they've had uh, kidney failure, will the kidneys ever work again? If they've had hyperperfusion to the brain. So this is where you as a nurse need to support the family with the prognosis. Uh, there may be a lot of guilt going back uh, and forth, which is like, again, why we keep a lot of the uh, different things on. So if they withdraw support, there might be guilt. Well, maybe if we just kept him on the warming blankets a little bit longer or kept him on dialysis another day or week. So this is a very difficult time for the family. Very difficult time for nurses as well. So with that being said, this right here is the end of the different stages of shock. And this is the end of part two.